I'm the kind of person that stops to watch water and wind. If you do a trip with me, you'll see this is the case, and I've been doing it for decades, and sometimes things still don't make sense. <music> Terminology in the outdoors is used as gatekeeping. It separates people into groups, the experienced and the inexperienced, the cool and the uncool. Boating is probably the worst of all. For example, when you go to a marine store and buy rope, it is just rope. But depending on how you use it, the name changes. If it's holding an anchor, it's called road. If it's raising a sail, it's a halyard. But if it's changing the angle of the sail to the wind, it's called a sheet. Sometimes if it's being used for something else, it's also just called a line. How is anyone supposed to know? It's not that important to know terminology, but it is important to know what the wind does to water. We generally learn terminology handed down from the yeah. people that teach us, but that doesn't always mean it's right. For example, I was taught that clapidus is when waves reflect back off a flat surface. That's just what I was taught, but I just learned that clapidus has to be reflected back at the same angle it hit the surface, thereby doubling the height of the waves. One of the things I like about kayaking over other forms of boating is that we aren't locked into terminology. Very few paddlers use port and starboard. They usually use left and right. Some call the front of the boat the bow. I generally call it the nose. But we do use chines and hull and keel and bulkhead, which are all traditional nautical terms. So it's a mix, and I like that. But there is some simple terminology regarding wind and waves we should know. Years ago, I came across the term DFC, dead flat calm. One of the reasons I like paddling in Prince William Sound is how often you get days that are DFC. But a little bit of wind changes things. Think of waves as one of three things, ripples, waves, and swells. If the conditions are right, ripples will become swells but the vast majority of ripples will die out before they even become waves. When ripples appear and then die out, they leave a pattern on the water that we call cat's paws, like a small cat was pawing at the water. As a paddler, cat's paws will tell us what the wind is trying to do. For ripples to become waves, we need a constant wind, ideally in a constant direction for a period of time. It's actually surface tension in the water that is flattening out the ripples whenever it can, but when there is enough consistent energy in the wind, it can break that surface tension and the small waves that form are called gravity waves because surface tension is no longer dictating the collapse of the wave, it's now gravity. While ripples without wind will last seconds, gravity waves without wind can last hours. Waves develop from three main influences. The strength of the wind, how long the wind is blowing, and the fetch, or how much distance the wind has to blow without obstruction. If the winds are strong enough and blow long enough, they will become swells. Think of swells as waves that have enough energy to travel far from their place of origin. Ripples will last minutes without wind. Waves will last hours and may cover miles. Swells will cross oceans. Swells are a long-term trend. One pattern can last for days, and both ripples and waves can occur on top of them without diminishing their energy. If you are paddling a coast and have a big swell with no wind and a clear sky, it's a safe bet that the weather that made those swells is coming your way. Could be days, but it's coming. Because historically sailors have a habit of exaggerating, the wave was the size of a mountain, an Irish sailor created the Beaufort Scale, which classified wind and waves. This is a great resource, but keep in mind it's designed for use in the open sea. On big trips, I still carry one as a resource in a chart case. But I tend to pay more attention to what is going on on land. What are trees doing? What are leaves doing? Those are all good indicators of wind. Are leaves in constant motion, or are they starting and stopping? Are branches in constant motion? It's harder for wind to move branches than leaves. 
Are tree trunks in constant motion? You probably shouldn't be on the water. Take the time before you start paddling to look at the sea state, to look at what the trees around you are doing, and then watch while you are paddling. Are ripples becoming waves? Will you paddle across a bay with a lot of fetch? Frequently, conditions will dictate your day, so pay attention. Maybe with practice, what the water and waves are combining to do will make more sense. Despite decades of watching waves and wind and water, it was actually a book, How to Read Water by Tristan Gooley, that sort of brought this all together for me. And it was a fascinating read and I highly recommend it. And I don't get anything if you buy it other than you'll read a good book. But it helped me understand something that I'd been wondering about for quite some time, which was this. These v lines in the water, I had always wondered, they, they develop when wind blows for a long time and I could never figure out or find what they were. And it turns out that they're caused by the wind cycloning like this over the water as it blows. It makes this sort of cyclone pattern and the lines are formed where the circles of the cyclones overlap, which I just thought was super fascinating. Um, if you found this super fascinating, do me a favor and hit like uh, and subscribe. That would be really great. It would help me out a lot. My books, my books are available on Amazon. Uh, and the Guides Way is still available on the coffee shop. Link is down below. That's going to move to Amazon and the price is going to go up. So if you want to grab that, grab it before the price goes up. All right. I'll see you on the water.